Welcome to Building the Future, hosted by Kevin Horick. With millions of listeners a month, Building the Future has quickly become one of the fastest rising programs with a focus on interviewing startups, entrepreneurs, investors, CEOs, and more. The radio and TV show airs in 15 markets across the globe, including Silicon Valley. For full showtimes, past episodes, or to sponsor the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Susan Steinbrecher. She's the president and CEO of Steinbrecher and Associates. Susan, welcome to the show. Thank you, Kevin. My pleasure. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. Um, what we're going to talk about today, selfishly, I, I'm really fascinated in. I, I think it's a huge issue uh, that I think a lot of people don't know how to deal with. But maybe before we get into that, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Sure. So born in Miami, uh, okay. raised in New Orleans, okay. and then moved on to San Antonio, Texas, and now the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Very cool. So you went to university. What did you take and why? Uh, so I ended up with a degree from what was called then Southwest Texas State, Southwest Texas State University, now called, uh, now called Texas State. Um, and actually the degree was in business. And I felt like it was really important. First of all, my career was lending me into being a, a good manager and a leader. And I felt like a business degree was important. But I also looked at that and said, that's sort of a sustainable degree, if you will. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> so fair enough. No matter what you choose to do, that's something that should help you out. <laughs> no, that, that makes total sense. Was there like a, a moment or a few moments growing up that made you want to get into business? Or, or just kind of what you said is like, it, you can basically use it no matter where any, where the industries go, right? You know, that's a great question. And, and when you when you ask that and reflecting, I would say the answer to that would be yes, there were those moments. So my father was an entrepreneur. Oh, okay. He was in the restaurant business. And then a lot of my family members ended up being entrepreneurs um, as well, all in pretty much the hospitality, food, beverage, airline, hotel industry. So very much the service industry. So I think that was in my blood. <laughs> oh, very cool. So... Walk me through your career up until what you guys are doing now. Great. So I spent 14 years in the hospitality industry, and I was one of those um, up-and-comer sort of star performers, became a general manager of a, a hotel at the age of 25, which was probably too young, frankly. <laughs> um, this is when you learn by fire, uh, trial by fire, and you, you make all the mistakes and you realize, oh, that doesn't work so well. And then you also get some real big wins. Um, I did, over time, become more and more successful. And to the point, three years after being a general manager of this hotel, I was asked to train general managers on behalf of the organization. Very so that cool. shifted me, yeah, out of operations into organizational development and training, and then spent a few more years with that organization and started my firm, which is hard to believe, 27 years ago this year. Wow, congrats. That's huge. Thank you. Yes, I'm very proud of that. It's, we've gone through the ups and downs of all the, all the, the recession cycles and the uh, bust and boom cycles, right? <laughs> sure. Well, and even in the hospitality space, just dealing with the different types of people and personalities. I, I'm sure you've experienced them all and every flavor of all the different personalities. That is for sure. It was a great foundation for starting our business where we custom design uh, training and development solutions, primarily around leadership development and customer service and provide executive coaching services, at, as well as we facilitate offsite meetings, retreats and of course, written several books. So anything in that development space, I think that foundation was very helpful. <laughs> very cool. So I'm curious, how did your business kind of evolve over 27 years and stay very relevant? Because I think what you guys are doing today, not saying what you did maybe a couple decades ago wasn't relevant, but I think what you guys are doing is, is very relevant today. So walk us through the transition of the 27 years being a business. Yeah, thank you for that. Well, to your point, it's relevant at those moments of time. Right, so when I first started the company, 
yeah, I decided, you know what, I want to take all my operations experience. I want it to be real world. Um, I want to be able to offer something to leaders and managers to help them be better leaders and managers in a practical manner, because I knew what it was like to be a manager and working, you know, the crazy hours and dealing with customer issues, dealing with employee issues and not feeling like I can always pull myself away and lock myself up um, to do training. And so I wanted something very relevant and very important that would literally build skill and capability. And so we started with custom designing learning solutions around every imaginable management or leadership topic, you know, everything from time management to how to conduct a meeting to coaching, counseling, employee, et cetera. And then we grew basically by request where people said, well, your workshops are amazing. We've learned so many skills um, in that. Can you also do a team building with our team or facilitate our offsite? So that kind of led to that product line. And then I got very interested in the executive coaching space. And this is now 20 years ago because I really wanted to see the light bulbs go off. I wanted to be able to sit in front of this person and do a one-on-one application or one-on-one learning, if you will. So that led us into offering those kinds of services. And then the books I've written along the way were very just in time and appropriate for what we were finding with our clients and experiencing with our clients at the time. And then now the meaningful alignment work that we've just come out, you're right, the timing cannot be more perfect. (laughs) The concept um, came to us about seven years ago. We started putting some real energy and meat around this about four years ago um, and just launching now with a new book at a one-day workshop, a two-day workshop, an assessment, a book, you know, the whole thing. So but, and and we're, we're so blessed because even though this has taken several years to get to where we are today, we could not have timed this more perfectly with what the world needs. So we are just feel lots of gratitude about that. Very cool. Con- congrats on all that because I, I wrote a tech book a number of years ago. It was a few hundred pages. It took an astronomical amount of time. You guys are doing, you guys did a novel and uh, all this other stuff around it. So, yeah, I'm surprised it didn't take you longer, to be honest. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, it takes it takes a village. Trust me. If we didn't have great editors and graphic designers and all these other things to help us out, it would have it would have taken us even longer. But, of course, for me, I'm sitting here going. We need to be getting this out in the world. We need to be getting this out right. in the world and business and our communities and everywhere. And why is it taking us so long? But the truth is we really have, when you reflect back, when we really put all hands down on this and really sink our teeth on this, we spent the last three or four years doing this. So it seems like it was just yesterday, but a lot of work has happened over a period of time to get to where we are today. Sure. So what exa- or what's the book called and, and what do you guys talk about in the book? It's called Meaningful Alignment. And what we're talking about in the book is that in our society today, I think we all are experiencing the social divide. We truly want to, I mean, big macro vision is we want to heal the social divide one conversation at a time. Well, well, how do you live a vision like that? And so we said we need to provide practical skills and tools to help people have those conversations that they're probably avoiding Sure. or they're not preparing properly and run into when things do not go well. So meaningful alignment is about how do you have the tough conversation, sometimes it's emotionally charged, but it's a high impact conversation for the purpose of gaining alignment with another individual or individuals um, so that we all can get on the same page about a decision or a future project or a direction well, you know, when the stakes are particularly high, it's important that you do that. And, and at the same time, and this is really important, Kevin, at the same time, maintaining, if not enhancing the relationship with that individual as you seek to get aligned and come to consensus and or agreement on a process or a decision. Okay. I, I want to dive into that a little bit deeper in a second, but... How do you, you guys wrote the book, I, I think kind of different than um, potentially other other books that, that are in this kind of category. So do you want to talk about how you guys or why you chose to write it like that? Yes, thank you. Uh, 
we purposely decided because other books that we had written were more traditional, either academic focused or client focused. We purposely chose to tell the story. We really felt, especially in this work, what was going to resonate with people is the story of real people. And so we, course came up with fictional characters, but I assure you that a lot of what is going on with this particular main character, his name is Carl's life, is reflective of many of our clients that we coach. Sure. So we know that there are struggles at work. And in this case, we chose to tell the story via a novel. And we felt that that would be more engaging and that people would relate and resonate at a deeper level. And of course, the feedback we've already received from when the book was launched a couple of weeks ago is that's exactly what's happening. And that's so we're really excited to get that kind of feedback. No, that that's very cool. So I want to dive a little bit deeper into some of the stories and, and experiences you talk about in the book. Okay. So you mentioned to me before, and and when I was going through the book, just obviously you can't necessarily 100% control obviously other people, uh, but there's things you can do to actually guide them or, or maybe keep it so things don't get kind of heated or people don't get really angry. Sure, that may happen, but there's things you can do that can actually maybe kind of diffuse the situation before it kind of goes off the rails and nothing gets decided. So do you want to maybe dive a little bit deeper into that side um, and, and we'll start there? Yes, absolutely. So what you're referring to is we're building skills in the book and in our training on how to facilitate or manage the emotion of the other person. Listen, we all know that everyone owns their own emotion or their own issue, and we don't really control other people, but you can influence and you can persuade and you can navigate things where they are more motivated, if you will, to stay in this relationship, stay in the game with you, especially when it starts to get tough. So some of the skills that we teach around that, one is what we call um, enhancing the person's self-regard. So it is thanking them for their time. It's, it's esteeming them where it's appropriate at every opportunity throughout the entire conversation. These skills I'm going to share with you help neutralize negative emotion. You're not going to take somebody from anger to happiness necessarily. <laughs> sure. What we're looking for here is just to neutralize negative emotion so that they stay in that conversation with you and they're more apt to hang in there. So another one is empathetic responding. So okay. it's deeply, uh, you know, it's responding in an empathetic way. And, and that means being fully present and saying, here's what, here's, I can really see how frustrating this is for you. I can appreciate that this has been a really difficult challenge. Thank you for sharing that with me. When the person begins to feel heard, that's when they have a tendency to start calming down because then they're like, okay, wait a minute. You're not judging me. You're not here to criticize me. You're not here to tell me I'm wrong. You're here. You're, you're literally saying to me that you're appreciating the, the, the predicament I'm in or the emotion that I'm expressing. And, and what, ma- what matters is that we're the, the person needs to feel that, or they're more than likely going to keep escalating the emotion. Why? Because they don't feel heard or they walk. Right. Right. So another one is listening actively and mindfully. By mindfully, we mean fully present, calm, centered in the body, really listening to what they're having to say, being able to respond back to what they're saying, paraphrasing back, but not just regurgitating back what the person said. You're really responding to both facts and feeling. So it's like, wow this is really a challenge for you. I get that. What you're expressing to me, I, I see where you are now. And, I, and here's what I'm hearing you say, and that's making you feel this way. Did I get that right? What have I missed? Well, imagine being on the receiving end of a conversation like that. You're more likely to say, hey, listen, this person really authentically and transparently wants to fix the situation or help me or be with me. And then the last is what we call inviting participation. 
And that's things like, what do you think is the solution? What do you think is the issue? What's the best course of action? What's your idea around this? And the idea is to use all four of these where it's appropriate throughout the entire conversation. And we do provide kind of a six-step process for how to navigate that conversation. Interesting. So how do, how do people that maybe don't get along have these conversations and try to keep it calm, I guess, for lack of a better term for it? <laughs> Well, you're, you're bringing up a very key point, so I'm so glad you said that, because one of the things that we share with our clients is we say, listen, you have to remember, you might be going into a conversation about X topic, but depending on the, the conversations you've had with this individual in the past and how well they went or not so yeah. well they went, that history is coming into this dialogue. You think you're talking about just this, but I'm here to tell you the elephant in the room is they remember all those previous conversations, which is also why getting it right so important. But let's take your point. Worst case scenario, they have not gone well. You are authentically trying to have a conversation, which is like our main character, Carl, in the book, is exactly the situation. He had a number of conversations that did not go well <laughs> with his mm -hmm. peer, and he's now really trying to crack the code, get on the right course, do the right thing, and so you, you have to recognize that somebody may not completely trust your motive because you're showing up so differently. Right. And why not call the elephant in the room out and say, hey, listen, you and I have had a series of conversations that have really not gone well. I think we can both 100% agree on that. My sincere effort is to try to put that behind us and to move forward. And I want you to know that I am here to have a fresh start and a, and a fresh beginning. I will take responsibility that I have not listened effectively in the past. I will take responsibility that, that perhaps I didn't do, I was not accountable to actions I should have been. And so are you willing to sit down today and try to move forward in a more productive and efficient manner? Now, the person may say no, but I think after a number of attempts, they're going to get, listen, if we have to align on this because the business says we do, <laughs> or sure. there's too much at stake if we don't, they're more likely to say, okay, let's, let's try this. So it doesn't mean that you've you know, flipped the switch overnight, but why not call out the history that's real? Because it's real, and the person knows it, and you know it. Sure. Well, and the other thing, too, I think when – well, at the end of the day, at least in my opinion – part of the big issue is probably a trust thing, right? And yes. you kind of, you can say, you know, I'll try better, but you actually need to try better in the future, right? Or kind of do what Correct. you say. Or I, I've even found, um, even if you go to, I, maybe this is a bad example, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but like if you go to your boss and you say, I think we need to do X, whatever X is, it doesn't really matter. And they say, you know what? Okay, let me look into it. I'll get back to you. If they never get back mm -hmm. to you, you're going to be disappointed. Uh, if you do mm -hmm. that a few more times and they never get back to you, then you're going to probably never bring anything up to them again. But if you go to them sure. and they, they say, look, I'll get back to you, and they come back to you and say, look, I had a look at X. We can't do it for these reasons. Whether you agree or not, the fact that they actually – basically gave you an answer, even if it was the answer you didn't want to hear, at least in my experience, you can at least respect the person and say, look, like, at least they said, gave me an answer, and sure, maybe it wasn't what I wanted to hear, but they gave me a good enough reason, and you kind of move on, right? Do you, is that like exactly. a simple example of what we're talking about here? Uh, I think so. I think what you're saying here is people just want, they want to be heard. They want to be considered. They want their ideas, especially in that scenario where you're coming up with an idea that you think it's really going to make the business better or better process or whatever it is. And, you know, here's the thing I always try to say to folks, listen, at least the person is not apathetic. <laughs> yeah. I mean, apathy is the enemy. If this person didn't care, they wouldn't bother saying to you, I think we have a better way to do this or a better process. This is someone invested in the business or invested in the relationship, whatever the situation may be. So you, you can't fault someone for the effort of trying to make things better. And to your point, even if you can't do it, say you can't do it, say why you can't do it, 
but have that conversation. And, and like you said, you we all at least most people, I mean, almost everybody I would know, I think just intuitively would answer this and say, sure, I may not like the fact that they're not agreeing with me or they're not going to do what I think needs to be done, but Hey, the person at least considered it. And you're more apt to go to them again with the new idea, the new innovation or the creative thought. If you feel it will at least be considered to your point. No, totally. Yeah. Interesting. So how do you handle others when they maybe don't want to talk to you or don't care about your ideas or kind of just dismiss you all the time? Well, and there's only so much one can do, right? Sure. You can keep trying to go in there. You can use these, what we call emotional management techniques, those four EMTs that I shared with you, yeah. um, self-regard, empathy, et cetera. You can use that as much as possible to try to influence and persuade this person to a course of action. If they really don't want to play and they've made it perfectly clear they don't want to play, that's like a whole other scenario. You're not going to force somebody to do something. In this case, I would say, is there another resource that you can go to? Is there someone else that you can get that done from? Is there someone else you can go to and say, I've tried to have conversations. This is not working. Can you help uh, mediate or facilitate a discussion with the two of us? Those are some other options that you might try. Okay. So you also talk about inside yourself kind of controlling and your emotions kind of at work and in your personal life. Do you want to dive in, into that and, and Carl's experience with those? Yeah, absolutely. So there are some skills that help us. So we're in the middle of the conversation mm -hmm. <laughs> and we feel ourselves getting really upset. Um, one of the skills that we teach is to, you know, in other words, we say hit the pause button. And what we're really saying there is don't say anything. Be silent, okay. <laughs> okay? Interesting. Because trust yourself enough to know that if I start talking as, as emotionally charged as I am, I can feel the heat rising within me. If I say something right now, that's probably not going to go well. <laughs> so this is where I say know thyself and trust your own self to know when this is a time to speak or a time to be silent. So hit the pause button on saying something if you think that is going to be a technique that will work well for you. Another one we talk about is, is taking deep breaths. Now, obviously, when you're in the middle of the conversation, you're going to need to have the, you're going to have to be silent enough, or this is where you begin to see some of these kind of come hand in hand. While the person's talking and you're not talking, you start focusing on your breath. And the minute you start focusing on your breath, you're now moving out of your head and into the body. Well, the minute you start focusing on an object, a breath in this case, you begin to get more centered and more calm because you're switching the part of the brain. So, for example, when we are highly emotionally triggered or charged, we're operating out of the amygdala, which is the fight, flight, or freeze response from our brain, right? We think we're going to die. We think we're being chased by a tiger, which we're not, but we feel that is the situation, so the only way to get out of that is to operate into a different part of the brain, which is the prefrontal cortex. And ways that helps us do that is calming and centering the body, i.e. the breath. <laughs> and then that leads me to the third one, which is deflecting attention. And what we mean by deflecting is ask questions to get, your, get the energy out of you so you can start focusing on breath and on to the other individual. So that can happen a couple of ways. One is you ask questions. So when you ask them questions, if they're emotionally triggered, in order to think of a response, they also have to activate the prefrontal cortex. So then they start answering, gives you time to breathe, focus on breath, and also things like writing. So they're talking, you're taking notes on what they're saying. You're kind of getting that energy released out of your body and you're also showing them positive self-regard because if, if, if somebody sees you writing and capturing what they're saying, they're going to think you really care, right? And that you sure. really are listening and you're really involved. And of course you are. And at the same time, you're giving your own body a break. And then the last we teach is delay the conversation if you really have to. Reschedule, refresh, hit the reset button. And these are for those moments when you are, you know, you are completely emotionally hijacked, you are triggered, whatever you say and do is not going to be pretty, much better to delay the conversation by saying something like, hey, listen, 
I'm, I'm upset. You're upset. This is not going to go well. Why don't we both take a step back, reschedule the conversation for tomorrow. I'll do some thinking on this. If you'll do the same, I would appreciate it. And let us both kind of get our heads together and come back in a, in a better position or a better frame of mind. That's better than letting it rip. Because remember the history that follows conversation? <laughs> the yeah. history of this conversation is going to follow the next. So trust yourself to know when you're just not able to calm yourself enough to have a conversation. Interesting. One of the things that you have on your website and, and your the videos on, on your site is the conflicts, conflicts between employees cause over $350 billion of lost productivity every year. Yes. That seems... I don't, I, I believe it. That seems really <laughs> crazy to me though, right? Like, do, well, do you know what I, I mean? <laughs> I do. And, and what you need to understand is how that translates out. What that translates, translates to is uh, people not getting on the same page or aligning on how to handle a business issue. Goals of the organization are not being met. Accountability is not there. So all kinds of ineffectiveness and inefficiencies are taking place. Frustration levels at its all-time high. People end up quitting or they stay and they're disengaged. What is it? Gallup's latest poll came out. I think it's 70% of employees are now technically what we call qualified as disengaged. That's a huge number, which means their body's sitting there, but their head is not there. Their heart's not there. They might be complying, but how committed are they to really doing the good work that this organization needs them to do and has hired them to do. So you put all of those together in a price tag on all of that, and that's where you get that number. Interesting. Well, and I'm also assuming that type of employee is doing just the bare minimum, right? It could be emotionally, you know, motivation-wise and emotionally, that's the situation. But honestly, think about it. How much stress does somebody go through when they're in a constant conflict, just like in our main character, Carl, with his peer? He's in constant stress. He comes home. He takes that stress at home. Now there's impacts on the family. He kicks the dog kind of thing. Right. He walks in. He's short with his kid. I mean, there's all kinds of impact beyond the workplace of people that are in this high level of frustration of not being able to get their work done. In this case, Carl felt like, well, it's because of him. And his screw ups that we're not getting this done. And of course, that's playing a victim that never serves us really well. And he's not really taking personal responsibility accountable for his own part of this, which of course he does learn to do in the book. <laughs> sure. So I'm curious though, in, in that situation, what advice or, or tips do you give people to basically disconnect the wrong word, but you know, people have a commute, obviously, usually between home and, and work. It's usually 15 to probably 45 to maybe an hour or longer. How, what advice do you give people to kind of calm down before they actually get home? If they've had a stressful day or it's been a stressful quarter or maybe a year, just to kind of not take out either your personal frustrations at work or your work frustrations at home personally. A great question, because not only in our training do we talk about ways to build sort of the reserve of resilience when you really need to call upon it, like, i.e., tough conversation, taking care of yourself, mind, body, and spirit. All of those are key aspects in terms of a long-term sustainable strategy. But for the transition, that's what I would call it, what you're saying, how do you have that transition time? from workplace back to home. And sometimes that can be 10 or 15 minutes, highly recommend meditation, mindfulness meditation in particular. We actually teach that in our class as well. Doing a practice like that, of course, every day builds that reserve of strength over time. But even if you sit in your car before you hit the highway, which we recommend strongly for a lot of reasons, as you might imagine, road rage, sure. et cetera. Yep. Um, you're sitting in the parking lot before you drive to go home, or if you're on a bus or whatever that is, do some meditation, do some deep breathing, think about things like gratitude. What am I grateful for? What works really well today? 
and sometimes I share with people writing a gratitude list really does help is it puts things back in perspective. Um, and I don't care if you have to start with what feels like, I can't think of anything I'm grateful for. Well, give me the lame stuff first. If we need to, I, I have good hair, whatever. I, start with where you start, but come up with at least 10 things you're grateful for. That also gives you an opportunity to shift perspective. And that's really what we're trying to do is we're trying to calm the system down, get out of the head, get into the body, come to a much more grounded, peaceful, centered place. And then once you've done that, walk into the door, right? Now, I also recommend if there's a significant other partner at home, sometimes they've had their day and they, they're ready to unload (laughs) everything that's gone on wrong with their day. Sometimes it's, it's perfectly okay to make a request and say, I need 10 or 15 minutes transition time from when I come home just to kind of, you know, change clothes, settle down, get something to drink, whatever that is. I need a little bit of transition time and that I am ready to hear anything you have to say. Often when you ask and make that as a request, they get it, they honor it, and that serves you and serves them in the end because then you have their full attention. Otherwise, you're not really listening probably at the level we would like you to listen actively and mindfully if you haven't had the transition time. So make that request. Sure. Yeah. yeah, No, I've done that in the past too. Like with my wife, sometimes it's like you just text her before you come home. It's like, sorry, I'm grumpy today. I need a little bit of time. Right. Stop for it. (laughs) So I've had some clients say they literally pull into the driveway and they sit in the driveway and do that for 10 or 15 minutes before they walk to the room, to their house rather. And I love that too. I, I, the reason I brought up the whole thing before you hit the road is we know road rage is sure. at an all-time high right now. It's out of control. So you really don't want to be taking your day's frustration on the road. We're feeling the brunt of that as a society every day. Sure. Because I, I think most people in a lot of cases want to get home as quick as possible. And you yes. see that one of the biggest issues is being stuck in traffic, right? And it just adds yes. to that level. And then, yeah, it's... It's interesting. The the other well, that's th- the other thing. Go, Go ahead. ahead. Sorry. sorry. No, keep going. No, I was just going to say that's the other thing. I always say to people, listen, when you know, know where you are, you're frustrated, you're upset, whatever. Again, first first advice would be don't get on the road until you've had some of this transition time to calm down. Okay, let's say you're on the road now. Somebody does something, they cut you off, or triggers you. Take, doing the deep breathing all the way through. Listen to peaceful music. This is not the time. I love hard rock. I love all kinds of music, but probably not the best music choice when you're really frustrated. Maybe it's something very peaceful, like classical or spa music or something to be in the calmness and some down as well. Or listen to books on tape type, type of a thing, podcasts, whatever, things that are more educational in nature when you feel like you're doing something with that valuable time instead of, you know, ruminating over the whole, ruminating over the whole stuff of traffic going on around you. Interesting. The, the other thing that you mentioned um, in the video is people will actually call in sick to avoid people. And that's not shocking to me. I'm just, I, I guess I was just kind of, I never really, really thought of that, right? So do you want to maybe talk a little bit about the extremes that people go to to actually avoid being in the same room or having a conflict with somebody? Yes, um, that is one example is they'll say, listen, I just, I cannot get to work today. Like I cannot face that individual today. So they call in sick or They say, I'm going to work from home today. You know, maybe they have the option to do that. They start choosing to work from home more and more and more because they're really avoiding seeing this person being with this person as much as they possibly can. Um, So all of that is very real. And I know a number of people that have admitted that that's been the situation with them before. They will go to somebody else to talk about this person versus go to them to talk about how can we get aligned, of course. Which, which also makes things 10 times worse because now it's the gossiping uh, behind each other's back stuff that now you've really elevated a level of frustration and you've also created a team dynamic often that is a 
big lack of trust. And sometimes through our support, I, I, I had an intervention team meeting with a, a team not too long ago, and they said it's just not becoming of our leadership team to be talking to each other the way they are and talking about each other and throwing each other under the bus. And this is a rock, of course, talking about their leaders. Interesting. There's an impact on a lot of people with stuff like that as well. I've also seen people not go to meetings because they know that person's not going to be there. They decline the meeting invitation. I mean, if you really talk to friends and people that have been in situations where there's that really tough person, I promise you all of these behaviors are going to admit to doing. Interesting. No, that's interesting. So I want to, you've kind of covered it throughout the, the show so far, but I want to talk about all the other services that you guys actually provide. So do you want to give us maybe a quick overview on all the different training and, and coaching and, and stuff that you guys do? Sure. So one of the key uh, business lines we have is custom designing a training solution for another company. So they come to us and say, our managers need help in X, Y, Z topic. We will custom design that solution to meet their vision and mission and principles and get out the key issues. Every scenario that we may create or case study will be real life to that organization. So that's like one line of business. We provide executive coaching services. We do that as well. And that's pretty much at every level from C-suite level kind of on down where we do things like emotional intelligence assessments. We do 360 interview processes. We um, do a proprietary piece called identifying one's belief systems, values, and mental models. And that's kind of another line. We facilitate offsite meetings, retreats. Sometimes that's a team building. Sometimes that's strategic planning. And we also do what we call a new leader assimilation process. So that is, you got a brand new leader coming into an existing team. How do you get them all aligned as quickly as possible? So the team has an opportunity to say, here's what I want this leader to understand about everything we've done and what we think is really working and please don't change it. (laughs) And what do we want to know about this leader? And it also gives the leader the opportunity to say, what's been going on with this team? Who's who, who's doing what, what's working, what's not working. So that's a new leader simulation process. We've been doing a lot more of those of recent times. Team intervention pieces where we come to understand what is actually happening with this team and what, what's creating a disalignment and how do we get them aligned, those kinds of services. So that's kind of in a snapshot the types of services that we offer. Plus, of course, workshops offer both my book, Heart Center Leadership. There's uh, workshops off that as well as the mini full line network that we're talking about today. Very cool. So you guys also have a free assessment test. Do you want to talk about uh, that test and and what exactly do people get out of it? Yes, thank you. So um, Dr. Robert Schaefer on my team, who is the co-author of the book and all of this work, just, you know, his PhD is in emotional intelligence, right? So he did a brilliant job of putting this model together. So he probably did 95% of it, and I did the 5% of the model, if you will. <laughs> so he put that together, and then we created an assessment off of that. So it's a quick 15-minute online assessment. You're sent a link to, to print off your results. You can get your report on your own, and we're offering that complimentary now. If they go to MeaningfulAlignment.com, they can click on Take That Free Assessment and um, see how they're more likely to show up from a primary motivational base. And what we mean by that is that people have a tendency to come more from control in terms of a foundational base, some security, some what we call achievement, and some what we would call affiliation. And there's six styles that we have created that fall within those four areas, if you will. And they can take this and see what their predominant style, meaning how they're more likely to emotionally engage and that high stakes, sometimes conflict type of a conversation. So it's a lot of fun. People enjoy it. They love getting their report and seeing their results. Interesting. So we're kind of coming to the end of the show, but let's close with mentioning where people can get more information about yourself, the book and any other links you want to mention. Yeah, absolutely. So, we have several, yeah, I, <laughs> several yeah. sites. So Steinbrecher and a, so Steinbrecher.com and that's S T E I N 
B R E C H E R Steinbrecher.com is our kind of mothership, if you will. Um, from the conversation we had today is off our latest work called Meaningful Alignment. So they can certainly go to MeaningfulAlignment.com as well. And that's where they can click on and get that free assessment and learn more about what Meaningful Alignment is all about. And of course, HeartCenterLeadership.com for the, for the work we've done around that as well. Um, so a couple of different places to go. And of course, we're on all the social media platforms as well. Very cool. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be on the show, and I look forward to keeping in touch with you and have a good rest of your day. Yes, yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Okay, bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. Please visit our website at buildingthefutureshow.com to join the free community, sign up for our newsletter, or to sponsor the show. The music is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com and keep building the future.